Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. How are y'all doing tonight? All right. Let's see if we can get this ball rolling with no hiccups tonight. <clears throat> All right. We're going to... Uh, let everyone give a chance to, for everyone to get jumped in here and um, we're going to make sure that things go off without a hitch tonight. And that's going to be a big thing <laughs> if we have no hang ups and stuff. And uh, welcome, uh, welcome Tim, Tippy, Libby and Bobby, Kevin, Peter, David, Roger, Mike and everyone else that's going to join us tonight. Tonight, we're going back to basics, folks. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different users in here, different levels, uh, skill levels and things. And um, I want to go over some of the basics within Vetric uh, to get a, a basic understanding of the user interface. We're going to talk about, you know, job setup. and We're going to talk about material setup. We're going to talk about layers. We're going to talk about, um, you know, your home start positions and things. So... We're going to go over a few uh, key areas uh, within the Vetrix uh, and, and kind of a basics and everything. And it's not going to be a long class. Uh, we're going to, we're, I'm going to try to keep it short and uh, direct and to the point and stuff and see if we can kind of just get a grasp of the basics. And then uh, that may help uh, alleviate some, you know, potential problems and things. We're going to talk about safe Z heights and home start positions. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mike, and uh, I appreciate that uh, letting me know about the video and stuff. Um, anytime you guys and girls have any problems with uh, any of the audio or video, let me know. I'm hoping that we will get through tonight flawlessly and everything, and um, and hopefully uh, some of you more experienced uh, Vetric users and all, you'll stick around, and uh, who knows? You know, we might pick up something. Uh, we're going to talk about the tool database. We're going to talk about different things and everything um, uh, within that. So let's uh, let's get uh, just a few more minutes. Let everybody give a chance to get in here, and we'll uh, we'll get this ball rolling. And uh, welcome, Ronnie. All right. Doom, 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 doom. Let me save a file here. All right. Let that save and then we'll jump right on over. <clears throat> so I hope everyone's doing well this evening. Man, I am a I'm a kicked pup today. Uh, it's been a it's been a tiresome day. Uh, been at it all morning and uh, working on some new things uh, for you guys and girls and um, just hoping that uh, everything starts to fall into place. I'm working on some actual videos that aren't live feeds. They're just straight to the point, shorter videos uh, uh, under some key topics and stuff. And uh, so, um, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of things today we're gonna when I say a lot of things I mean we're gonna cover some of the basics I want I want everybody to have a basic understanding of uh, the software their layout and um, just different tools and stuff 
and then hopefully this will you know this will help maybe this will uh, uh, help uh, alleviate some kind of uh, beginner questions and things and everything so we're gonna go from there all right welcome Steve and uh, Mary Quinn we can begin now Steve and Mary here no, I'm just getting hasty hey, how you doing buddy uh, Steve and Mary my favorites from Tennessee I got a lot of favorites from Tennessee but they're one of my favorites I got to go to their house and spend an evening with them when I set up their machine and stuff very awesome people and Dennis welcome Jeff all right seems like we've got a good crowd here so without further ado let's jump on over to the Vetric and let's get into the basics and uh, go through some of the software and see if we can get a better grasp on things so let's move on over to our scene and that should get us where we need to be <clears throat> all right some of you may be using older software some of you may be using the newer software uh, 9.5 uh, 9.515 9.516 and um, we're gonna start there uh, as uh, soon as um, we get to okay here we go so in the software just so you know uh, throughout the days the weeks the months and stuff you know every six months Vetric puts out a major update and that's where we go from like let's say version 9 to 9.5 and then 10 will be coming and stuff but in between there uh, they have these uh, little patches and fixes and things and a lot of times you will see that in the upper right corner of the software a uh, little blue link uh, that would tell you that in my case I have one that says version 9.516 is available and so you know if you see those little patches and everything let's run them and uh, that's where I'm gonna start is uh, let's go ahead and I've got uh, a little patch update and uh, let me turn that phone off so we don't get any more alerts and stuff but let's uh, let's start with that so uh, first thing I'm gonna do and we might get a little bit of a black screen when I do this but I'm gonna click on this link here uh, letting me know that 9.516 is available and what that's going to do is um, that's going to ask me if the software can make changes to the computer and I'm going to click yes and then it's going to open up the updater and with the updater we're going to go ahead and click next and it's going to download the uh, update to the computer and then we're going to get a, a, something that comes up and tells us that we have to close the, the program for it to begin. And that's gonna be this little window here. The application has uh, been updated and must restart in order to continue. That simply means close the Vetric software. So let's go ahead and close the Vetric software. I'm not gonna save my changes right now. And then I can go ahead and click OK. And it will begin the uh, running the updater. And let me get that over on the screen over here. Okay. And once it's done running the updater, it's ready for us. Uh, you know, it's available and uh, it's ready for us to continue. So we're going to click next and we're going to let it run this patch. Now, the patch could take just a few seconds. It could take just a few minutes. Uh, depends on your internet connection and things. So uh, this should only take about a few seconds here to run across. And when it's finished, then the actual installer will come up. And uh, once that uh, runs, uh, we'll wait for the installer to pop up. And now it's ready to patch, okay? So this is the installer uh, that's gonna patch uh, the software from the 9.515 to the 9.516 or whatever the version may be. So we'll go ahead and click start and we'll run that installer, okay? So if you ever get, if you ever see if any minor updates and everything, um, run those updates and stuff. Keep your software up to date. Now if there's a major update going from version nine to 9.5 or 9.5 to 10 or, or what have you, those updates are actually going to be inside of your Vetric VNCO account. When you registered your software, you registered for your account, you created a password so you can log in at Vetric.com. And you will actually go into your account 
where it has a copy of your software and uh, downloads. It has a copy of all your, uh, you know, your, your models and clip art and everything that came with the software. Um, it'll store those in there for you to download from your Vetric and BNCO account. But most of the patches and everything, uh, you don't have to log into your account. They're right there in the top right of the software. So we can go ahead and click finish. The patch is finished. And now if I go back into my Vetric software, um, Let's go to my Vetric 9.5. When it opens, I'm gonna get a message letting me know that I was successfully updated to the latest version. Uh, so here it comes. And now I have two choices at this point. One, I could click cancel if I'm done, you know, or I could click okay. Now if I click okay, it's gonna open up a web browser and it's gonna show me the release notes. It's gonna show me uh, what 9.516, what the issues were that were addressed. And one of the things they did, they added the Russian translation to the software. They fixed the SVG import problem with some circular arcs. They fixed issues with uh, simulation slider speeds. Uh, the lowest speed should now match the accurate feed rate of the tool used. Uh, they fixed issues with the helical arcs output, which is a great thing for us because we use the Helical Arcs uh, post-processor, Digital Woodcarver Helical Arcs post-processor with the new uh, 9.516 uh, and also you know, uh, with uh, Planet CNC. So that's a great thing that they fixed uh, those outputs and stuff, any issues that had with them and everything. Uh, they fixed some trimming tool, picking up vectors from the other side of the software or if you're doing a two-sided job. Uh, they fixed uh, the, the um, tool database percentage problems, uh, crash with invalid toolpath previews, imported toolpath cut display for rotary jobs, uh, and uh, component preview shading on the flat planes. And then they fixed the 64-bit uninstall, leaving entries in the apps and features list, you know, uh, and all that. So there's a few fixes and everything. And we can always go back and look at, at the different fixes that are small little updates. Every time you see, you're like, man, didn't I just update 9.515 or 9.514? And like, here's another one. Well, they're constantly going through and uh, 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 making corrections and changes and, and, and things and stuff. And so we can look through and we can see some of the changes and stuff that they've done all the way up to the latest uh, version and all. And uh, it's good to, you know, see. So that way we know, hey, you know, they, they're fixing some of these things that I'm running into and stuff. Okay. So uh, back in our Vetric software now, we'll go ahead and uh, we're going to create a new file. Now, if we're starting with basics and everything, understand that, uh, you know, we can create a new file or we can open an existing file, something we've worked on before. And also know that recently opened files... Uh, we've got a list of files that we've recently been working on here and we can change how many of these files uh, Get shown here in the recently open files list and stuff and I'll show you where that is and all but let's create a new file here and When we go into the software, we've got our job set up Now I'm gonna set this job up uh, for a 15 inch uh, board and It's I'm gonna just use a 1 by 6 so it's gonna be five and a half inches wide and three quarters of an inch thick and on the, you know, if I have a single sided job, I just have to put in the width, height, and the thickness of the material. I got to tell it where I'm going to touch off my Z0 position. And right here, this is where you've got to know what's going on with the job that you're going to be doing. Okay. Uh, should I set this job up to touch off on the top of the material or should I touch off on the bottom of the material, which would mean my waste board or my tabletop, whatever I'm sitting on. Now, if you're doing a three-dimensional carving, let's say as an example, and the entire surface of that board is gonna get milled away, let's say during the rough cut or something, that entire surface is gonna get milled away, well then I've gotta change tools, you know, I've gotta change bits, and I've got a tool change, and if I've got this set up to the material surface, then it's wanting me when I change that bit to touch off on the original surface, the uncut area, and I can touch off anywhere on my project board on that surface I don't have to I don't have to touch off in my start position I can move my CNC anywhere that I need to move to touch off but if that entire surface is milled away then there's nothing to touch off to and now I'm kind of like okay what do I do so we need to kind of know uh, what we're planning uh, for our job setup and of course you know let's say if we don't know that until halfway through you know I'm like I'm gonna just mill the entire surface and make a plaque with a bass sitting up and whatever we can always go back and change the job setup and, and before we calculate our tool pass and all that stuff if we need to. But 
uh, for the most part, if we're touching off on the top and there's, you know, where there's going to be material surface to touch off on, then we'll use the material surface. If that material surface is going to get milled away, then we would work off the machine bed. Now, when it comes to the machine working off the machine bed, that's not the only reason we would work off the machine bed. Uh, another reason is, is if I'm cutting through the material, if I'm cutting all the way through my project, uh, and uh, you know I don't want to spoil my spoil board or cut into my waste board, then I would typically set up to work off the machine bed. My spoil board would be zero. Uh, that will guarantee that I, you know, I'm going to cut cleanly through my material, but not cut into my waste board uh, and, and things. And it just, you know, because it'll stop at zero, not cut below zero. Uh, another reason for working off the machine bed would be if I was doing a rotary job. Uh, typically, on the rotary job, on a rotary job. Uh, we are zeroing out on the center of that cylinder, that center axis and everything. And so if I were to take that cylinder and unwrap it into the flat plane, because we're drawing in a flat plane, that center becomes the bottom. So we'd work off the machine bed for that setup and everything. So uh, that would be another reason for working off the bottom. Now me, because of my jig, uh, my cam clamping jig, my waste board on my CNC that's also uh, you know acts as a clamping jig, uh, because of that and everything, I typically always work off the machine bed. Uh, but um, if for some reason I'm not cutting through the material and I'm just doing a carving and all, then I might just set it up to work off the top. You know, it's not like it always has to be that way. If I'm cutting through, absolutely, always work off the machine bed. But if I'm not cutting through them, if I'm doing a V-carve or some pocket cut or something like that, then I'll... It's kind of a 50-50, you know, am I going to touch off on the top or touch off on the bottom? But keep this in mind. What if I was working with a piece of old barn wood or pallet wood or, or a piece of, uh, you know, old sawn board or something that uh, I didn't run through a plane or I want that rustic look, you know, that, that kind of rustic sign? Well, that, 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 that weathered board or what have you could have some high spots and low spots and not really not be, you know, true to the surface and all. And I may not want to set my Z0 for the top of that. I might want to, you know, because I could be touching off on a high spot or a low spot. So I would typically probably set it up to work off the machine bed. All right. So I think we got kind of Z0 nailed down. Now, as far as XY datum position, um, really, you can start from any of the four corners or from the center of your board. Now, if I'm doing a live edge type of uh, scenario, uh, let's say, let me grab this sign here. Let's say I'm doing a, a kind of a live edge sign and I don't really have a defined corner to zero it on because I've got some bark and stuff over here and stuff. Then I'll typically find my center area of my carving area and I will zero out on that center carving area and stuff. Um, but if I have a board that's a you know, nicely defined corner and stuff, uh, you know, I'll, I'll work off a corner because one, um, I'm using my, my jig, my waste board on my table, and it has a 90 degree fence that everything references off of. And what that allows me to do is uh, set my X and Y on that corner and zero, zero, you know, so it'll stay set throughout the day unless something changes or I lose position or something like that. So wherever you want to start from, uh, you can go ahead and set up and start. And for me, I'm just going to set this job up to work off the bottom left corner. Now, Here's the key thing what a lot of people may not, may or may not understand is this model resolution section over here uh, within the software. Now, the model resolution has a lot to do with the quality of the cut of the 3D model that I'm working with or creating. Um, and we have three choices and by default it's set to standard, you know, standard fastest. And this doesn't mean it's cutting faster than the other one. This means in that 3D view, when I'm looking at the 3D view, the amount of pixels, I'm working with about a 1 million points in a standard view, the amount of pixels it takes to generate that preview and to generate that preview cut and everything, uh, the standard view is the fastest, you know, because the lowest pixels and everything to generate and create that 3D view. Um, my very high says three times slower, so it's three times slower than the standard in creating that preview cut, generating those pixels to create that 3D image. And then, of course, my final option in this standard setup is the very high, seven times slower, meaning it's taking seven times the uh, run time in the preview, not carving time in the preview, to generate that because it's working with about four million points or pixels and things to generate that 3D view. 
Now, what a lot of people may not know is there's hidden options within that modeling resolution and we uh, uh, can obtain them or, 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 or get them by, if I come in here and cancel this setup, if I hold down my shift key, when I click create a new file, then in that model resolution, let me get back to my 15 by five and a half here, 5.5, three quarters, uh, there we go. If I look now, there are two additional options available to me within the uh, modeling resolution. We have an extremely high 20 times slower and a maximum 50 times slower. Now that extremely high works with about 8 million points or pixels to generate that preview. And the maximum uh, is about 16 million pixels and everything. Um, and these two options, they're very rarely used uh, but if you're if you're in the Aspire and you're building models and things, you may want to build these models in one of these higher options to get that nice uh, all those pixels and everything. Because if if I'm using the standard very low pixels and all, and my model is pixelated, well that's going to translate. It's going to it's going to create that model with all those pixels in there, and that's going to translate into the quality of the cut, the actual 3D cut, the finished cut, and everything. So I want the highest, smoothest resolution. I want I want as many pixels as I can, uh, and um, you know, 20 times uh, slower. The uh, the the extremely high is a really good one. Uh, maximum is if you're really kind of building a model and you want it in this highest view and stuff. But um, many people don't go into this option. You know, holding the shift key when they click create a new job. Because you know it's it's really uh, only purposes when you're when you're building models and all you want the highest resolution to create that model and everything. Now let's say that I have a model that uh, you know that I might have purchased a, you know STL or something like that. Well, when I'm importing that model in, uh, no matter what the quality of that model is and stuff, uh, my resolution still plays a role. Now I can't I can't turn a bad model into a great model. Um, you know, if it, if it was poorly created or what have you, but most models are, are really high definition and everything and stuff. And I want to at least be in the very high, uh, you know, of the three options. I want to at least be in the very high when I'm generating this because I do not want when it, when I, when I, uh, orientate that model and bring it in, I do not want to, uh, have any pixelation in my model because that's going to affect the quality of the cut. So if you're ever working with models, you know, just making a sign, it's got a model in there and stuff, and you're sitting there on standard on that model resolution, it's, you're going to get a low quality cut uh, and everything. So make sure you're at least in that very high, and this is my recommendation, at least that very high. And the only time you would use the extremely or the maximum is if you're building models, and it might be like when you're in the spire or something, you know, okay? So I'm going to set this to a very high resolution. And, uh, you know, as far as the look, the appearance, whatever the appearance you want it to be, I just, I'll use a simple maple. Uh, and then we'll click OK and create our job. Now, it's a lot of information to swallow there. So we're going to stop there for a second and answer two questions that popped up. Uh, David Kinsey asked, so if you're using a waste board as the starting point and the material you're cutting on, is not flat, how do you ensure you do not drag your cutting tool across the high parts of the board? That's a great question, and that's gonna get into the uh, material setup side of the software we're gonna be talking about here in just a moment, but let's go ahead and kind of talk about it. I want you to notice something if you can see it. I'm not sure how blurry the buttons are or anything or how clear they are within the software uh, showing here, but notice how my home position says X0 Y0 and Z 1.55 inches. Okay. Now, if I go into that set button on that material setup and I look at my home start position, my home start position, the Z gap above the material is 0.8 of an inch. Okay. That is my safe height above my material, the top of my material, you know. So that's how high the bit is going to be, you know, when it goes up to start. And when it comes home to shut off, that's going to be that uh, safe height position. And the software has added that 0.8 to my material thickness of 0.75 for a total of 1.55 inches. So that means that Z0 is my bottom. It's going to raise up when I hit start. It's going to make sure that it's up above the thickness of my material plus that 0.8 of an inch above the surface of the material. 
to make sure that I clear my material around and things. And the above that home start position, we have our rapid gaps above material. When that bit is moving across the material from one place to another and everything. And, and right now I have my clearance, my Z gap clearance uh, is uh, set at 0.2, you know, 0.2 of an inch. Uh, my plunge is set at 0.2. That's my default settings. But if I was worried uh, that um, my board wasn't flat, David Kinsey, uh, you know, if you're doing some kind of warp feature, hopefully you got it somewhat flat enough to where you can carve, uh, to where you don't have high spots and low spots, or you're running a warp function within the controller software or something. But regardless, if I want to ensure that my bit is going to, when it's traveling from one place to another to carve, that it's going to raise up to a, a you know a decent height position, then I would adjust that adjust that accordingly. You know I might have it set to you know uh, 0.5 for the Z clap and uh, you know 0.5 for the plunge or 0.375 you know for that and everything. So uh, that's going to be that rapid gaps when that machine's rapidly moving over the board from one place to another to carve and everything. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna be that's that's the gap. That's how high it's gonna be up when it's moving from one place to another. So you want to set these accordingly uh, to make sure you you don't do uh, what you said there, uh, drag across the board on the high parts and things like that. You want to give yourself enough clearance, and that's in your material setup. So your job setup and your material setup is essentially you've got your job setup at the top part of the material setup up here. Uh, but then you also have uh, things like the model position the material, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, you've got your rapid Z gaps above the material when it's rapidly moving from one place to another. And then, of course, you have your home start position, meaning that when you hit the start button in your software, what it's going to do. In my case, it's going to go, it's going to raise up to 1.55 inches, that three quarters of an inch plus 0.8. And then it's going to make sure it's at home. If not, it's going to go there first before it starts its carving and when it's finished carving that job it's going to come back to that x y zero and 0.8 on the z that 0.8 gap above the material before on the z and everything so uh, one of the things that you need to be aware of in the home start position um, is that if you let's say that you have a five inch z height five inch z height from the top of your table to the bottom of the router that's your maximum travel okay let's say you've got that maximum travel and let's say that uh, you have a let me see if I can grab a couple of boards here to illustrate let's say that you've got a waste board on your table that's three quarters of an inch and you've got a project board that's three quarters of an inch well that's an inch and a half right there and let's say that you have an inch and a quarter of bit sticking out of that router. Well, now we're at three and three quarters. That only leaves me one and a quarter of inches, one and a quarter inches above my material that I can raise up before hitting my Z limit. Now, what happens if I have a three quarter inch waste board on my table and I've got a, you know, three inch project board and my Z home position is set to 0.8, right? And I've got, let's say I'm at three and three quarters now. Let's say I've got, uh, uh, let's say I've got an inch of bit sticking out of my router. I'm at four and a quarter. Now that only gives me 0.75 inches, three quarters of an inch of raise left, you know, before I hit my limit. Well, that home start position, that, that Z gap above material needs to go down. You got to set that down. So you have, you know, so um, I, I don't want to raise, I can't raise up 0.8 of an inch because I, I don't have it, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I need to set that to maybe a half inch or a quarter of an inch or something, you know, so that when I hit start that I don't right out of the gate hit my limit and then all of a sudden that bit start plowing down and, and carving too deep. So that number's got to go down. That home start position Z gap above the material needs to get lower and everything. As a default, uh, we've generally got it set to 0.8, you know, three quarters of an inch. But if I've got a three quarter inch board, I've got a three inch project here, I'm three and three quarters, I got one inch of bit sticking out, you know, whatever let's say I'm now I'm at four and uh, uh, four and three quarters and uh, I only have a five inch maximum travel well, that only you know if I'm at four and three quarters here let's see here three three and three quarters four and three quarters of an inch guess what that only gives me a quarter of an inch of travel right boom before I hit my limit you know and stuff if I try to if I hit start and it's set at 0.8 
digga, 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 you know, and then I'm going to lose my Z and then boom, it's going to start burying down and burying that bit. So that number needs to be under a quarter of an inch, you know, an eighth of an inch, 16th, whatever, you know, where the bit can travel, you know, clearly and safely and all, but not raise up too high to hit my limit right out of the gate. Okay. All right. And so David Kinsey in Toolpath Setup, you can determine your rapid Z and Z height. Thank you, Jim, for jumping in with that. Hello, Keith from Las Vegas. And Todd says, in a rapid move, uh, you're not cutting material. Correct. Well, uh, rapid move, when you're, when you're rapidly moving from one place to another, uh, the router's not cutting. It's rapidly moving from one place, then it's going to go down whatever the plunge speed it is, and it's going to cut at its feed rate, and then it's going to raise up to its safe, uh, you know, uh, Z clearance. And then it's going to move to the next spot, so on and so forth. So that's a rapid move. It's not cutting in that rapid move. Okay. So in, in the basics, when I'm setting up my job, you know, when I'm setting up my job, and you can only have one uh, job set up at a time, so let me close this one. When I'm setting up my job, you know, my single side job, my board size, where I'm touching off at and everything, as soon as I program in that Z0 position, the software is going to start doing its thing and it's going to start, uh, you know, uh, adding. So if I was touching off on the material surface and I click OK, well, if I go look now at my home start position up here, home position X0, Y0, Z.8, you know, but if I set my material set up to work off the machine bed now it's going to take in effect the uh, size of my material the thickness of my material and uh, you know that's going to change my Z home start position to 1.55 inches it's going to raise up the three quarters of my board and then to my home Z position 0.8 above the material my Z gap above the material okay all right so well now all right so now once we click OK uh, within the software, we're taken into our drawing tab. Uh, these are where our drawing tools are. We have file operations and things. And right out of the gate, right here, right at this job setup, you really should get into the habit. And I'm bad about doing this myself. When I create a job, I usually don't save that job until like I start saving the tool bath, like, oh, I need to save my design too. But you know, we, we, we all have to, you know, kind of retrain ourselves and stuff. But right here at this point, boom, I just hit okay and I set up my job. Now I need, I should come over here and I should save my design. Save early, save often. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna go into my class file folder and I'm gonna create a new folder and I'm gonna call this my uh, basics class. And in this folder, I'm going to create my um, back to basics job. I'm going to hit save. And normally I don't put uh, spaces and file names, but that's okay. Now this is going to save this job as back to basics. And now as I'm drawing or in, in, in creating and stuff, I can come over here to the save button under file operations and I can save my updates every time I make change and all. Save early, save often. That way in case the power goes out, uh, in case, you know, computer dies or something, all this work that you put into it and all, um, you don't lose it. Or, you know, some people think saving their toolpath saves their design and that's not the case. It's two separate things. So they go, they go and save their toolpath. And then all of a sudden they, you know, they've saved their toolpath files and everything and they go to close out of the uh, uh, Vetric software and it asks them if they want to save their changes and they're like, no, I just did. Boom. And they hit no. Well, it's not, it's, as, it's not asking if you want to save changes to your toolpath. It's asking, do you want to save changes to your design? And when they say no, it doesn't say that design. And now they're going back and they, they, they might need to make a change in their toolpath or something. And they go back and go, well, where'd my design go? I saw here's the tool path, but where's the design? I lost it. I can't find it. And it's because they didn't save it. And then they thought that saving their tool path saved it and stuff. And that's not the case. So save your design early, save often throughout the course of working and everything and saving your Vetric design and saving your tool path is two separate things. So don't think that saving your tool path is going to save your design. So if you get asked that question, do you want to save your changes? 
typically you're going to hit yes. Okay. All right. All righty. <clears throat> See, I feel like things are going well. I don't want to get too confident. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. All right. Good evening, everybody that's joining us now. <clears throat> All right. So within the uh, software, we can import files into the system. And, and here's the thing. Um, typically, let's say that you've downloaded an EPS or, or a DXF file or, or something uh, and you want to uh, open that job. Or, or create that job or, or something. I'm going to recommend that you create your job and your job setup and everything. And then you come in and import that vector. Whether you use the file operation import vector or import photo like JPEG, PNG, bitmap, GIF, or TIFF. That you import from here or from the file menu, file import, and you have your import options and everything. Now, I can go in... And uh, if I were to close out of this right now, and if I were to go into my files, and if I were to go into my uh, downloads, let me go to my downloads here, and I were to go to a uh, DXF, and let me see if, I can, if I've got a DWG, not a DXF. Uh, let me find my trans matrix ABCD EFG. One more row down. ST. Bear with me, it's hiding here somewhere. Okay, so this DWG file. Now, if I, from the get go, I don't have Vetric Open or anything. If I go to open this file, uh, you know, and I've got it set that I can open in VCard Pro, you know, what have you that it's gonna read that file and everything, it will open up in that VCard Pro. Now it's gonna open up most likely in my older VCard Pro software, um, which it did, uh, but it automatically set up the job based on that DXF file or that DWG you know, file. Um, you know, it's setting up the job based on that. And you see here, it threw in an offset, you know, cause that, that design had an offset built into it and has a negative 14 inches in the Y and the offset, which I do not want. And, uh, and everything, um, what that's saying is, is right here, you know, that's my X, Y datum down here. That's my start point, but it's saying use the offset and look where my zero zero is in this top corner here. Uh, you know, so I would think I'm zeroing out on my board, but it's going to, you know, it's, it's off by 14 inches in the Y axis and everything. I don't recommend opening a file that way because, you know, uh, however that creator created it, that's what's going to kind of get populated within the job setup and all. What I recommend doing is, you know, coming in and let's uh, go to our Vetric software. And I click close here. And I'm gonna create my job based on you know whatever it is, whatever it may be. And then I'm gonna import that file into the job. Uh, so if I went to my downloads here, and I went to uh, downloads, and I went to my matrix. Uh, me. Matrix, 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 matrix. Bear with me. I just had it. Okay, three. Yeah, template. Let me find the DWG file. I'm going to import that in, and now it's going to import that into my job, but it's not changing my job setup. You know, it's not altering it anyway. Now, from here, I will decide what needs to be done with this DWG file, their SVG or whatever it may be. Do I need to resize my job, you know, my board for this because I didn't set it up quite right? Do I need to scale this down, you know, so it fits, you know, within my project board? What is it that I'm doing? But I don't want that dictating my job setup. So I'm not going to just sit there and try to open it from my files. You know, I'm going to import it in. Okay. And your 
types of files that we can import, we can import those DXF files, DWG, EPS, Adobe Illustrator files, AI, uh, PDF files, PVC, V3D, and V3M and CRV. Those are all three vetric format files. PVC is that photo V carve, uh, V3D is vetric 3D, V3M is vetric 3D model, and then your CRV is, of course, your V carve file. And uh, then we have SKP, your SketchUp files, or SVG. So these are the types of files that we can bring in as far as vector files are concerned. Now, we can also import images. Now, an image, when we import an image, a JPEG, PNG, bitmap, GIF, TIFF, T-I-F-F and T-I-F, and J-P-E-G, uh, these are pixeled images. And uh, they have to be traced uh, by the software. Uh, and they got to be converted into a vector before we can create a toolpath on them. And so uh, we can import those images, those different image files, but we, they do have to be traced and they have to be converted to a vector or, or turned into a vector through that tracing. And then we can create our toolpath on that design. We can, it's a scalable graphic at that point. Now here's a key tip. You know, when you trace an image, you get that vector, take that vector and export it out. So let's say that I go in here and let me go to my uh, desktop and dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. let me go in here and let me grab an image. Let me zoom in to this image. Now, if I trace this image and everything, and I'll turn the fading off and stuff, but if I trace this image, let me turn my this up. If I trace this image and everything, and I come in and I, you know, uh, apply that tracing and I'll talk about photo tracing in a minute. We'll get more involved in that in just a second. But, you know, I come in here and I, I, I come in and I, you know, get rid of and let's close this tool. Always close your tools when you're done. And I get rid of don't want. Now I've traced this image and I, this is a scalable graphic now. I'll never have to trace that image again. If I want to use this image in other files and things, I'm going to simply, instead of retracing that photo over and over and over again, I'm going to select that photo and I'm going to export it out of the software as a DXF file. DXF, SVG, PDF, AI, EPS, but I'm going to use a DXF. That's kind of my default. And within that, you know, we can go through and, uh, you know, if I go into my downloads and everything and... Um, is it in my downloads? I don't think it's in my downloads. I think it's in my backup. I started backing up everything now. Uh, ABC. ABC. STUVWX. Hey, where's my files at? That's right. I'll use my 2018 files folder. Um, digital store. Wherever you want to save them. Now, I'll come in here and I'll create a folder uh, wherever it's going to be. I'll create a DXF folder and uh, I do have a DXF folder. I just got to figure out where it is. I got too many files and we're not going to waste time tonight doing, you know, searching for stuff. But I'll create a DXF folder and this will be my, <clears throat> I'll call it my leaping bass, right? Whatever it is, you know, and uh, I'll save that. And by doing that and everything, my next job, if I need to use that, I can import... And I can go in and import that DXF right into the job. It's already traced. I don't have to trace that picture ever again, uh, you know, and everything. So create a folder, a DXF folder, and all your images you've ever traced and all. Export those tracings so you can use them in future jobs and stuff so you never have to trace that image again. You know, you just bring it in and uh, do what you got to do. It's a scalable graphic now. You can size it up, size it down, move it around, whatever you got to do, and create your toolpath on it. You don't have to mess around with image tracing. Okay, it's going to be a tip of the day. Just export your images, your tracings and stuff and create a folder, a nice collection of those uh, that you can use in future projects and stuff. That way you're not repeating the same trace steps over and over and over again. You should only have to trace an image once. Once. After that, export it as a DXF so you can use it in future projects. All right, let's get rid of this stuff. Okay, now <clears throat> the... Um, when we're within the software and everything, uh, we have, you know, our clip art section. We have uh, options and things like that. Uh, just so you know, most of the times, if we were to look at the File Explorer window, let me pull up my File Explorer window here. 
uh, all of our Vetric options are stored within the C drive, users, in the public folder, and public documents, you'll see Vetric files. And whatever, uh, you know, Vetric files here, your clip art, uh, your models and all your clip art and everything are, are stored here. Um, if you want to add, you know, on that clip art, let's say you, uh, you know, you, you have other clip art that you buy from Design and Make, you can drop those in the Design and Make folder or typically when you run them, they go into the Design and Make folder and stuff. But um, you will uh, uh, stand by for one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the Design and Make jobs and things, uh, if you do purchase anything off of Design and Make, they'll go into that folder and stuff uh, on your public documents. Uh, you've got uh, your material images. This is the material images where you, you know, you know, let me minimize this. Over here, when you're viewing a toolpath, these material images up here, um, you can create and, and add images to that, and it'll add it to this library of materials that you can work with and stuff. Now, you'll also find this folder within the files application, the programs application data folder. So if I go to open application data folder, um, within that window, I have my bitmap textures and everything, and I've got different woods uh, and uh, stuff within there. That's all those little previews when you're previewing and stuff. And we can add custom images to this library, either place, uh, so that we can uh, work with them in our preview section and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, oops, let's not do that. And let's go back in here. Uh, so other than um, that, all of our tutorial files within the software, and I'll go to my Vetric uh, VCar Pro, and all of those tutorial files, uh, 90 plus videos in your tutorial library, your Vetric tutorial library, uh, those file folders for those tutorials are here and within those folders uh, you've got the files or your files may be empty now my files I have the folders but I don't have the actual files for the job in this, in this case the five star coffee Okay, stand by. Let's pause here for a second and give uh, the old uh, one-two punch. Uh, he says it didn't pay the bill. Uh, let's give this a moment to uh, get caught back up. Man, oh man. Uh, web, um, Streamlabs, get your shit together. I have the biggest problem with uh, them. I think I'm going to change uh, my... My streaming scenario. Streamlabs OBS, get your shit together. All right. Excuse the French. Doesn't that just upset you? Because I have no idea where you guys lost me uh, and where we lost each other and stuff. Uh, so um, I have no idea. So somebody kind of let me know about what I was saying when we got disconnected. Uh, let me know that in the chat area and we will just. Uh, we will just move on from there. <laughs> All right. Friggin' Streamlabs. All right. You know, kicking my butt. Okay. Stand by one second. Let me uh, close. I'm going to close some other programs 
and stuff uh, that might be, I don't know. I doubt anything is causing the problem, but other than Streamlabs itself. All right. Um, <laughs> I wish I could, Mighty Mark. Uh, you were saying the files were empty in the Vetric software. Thank you very much. All right, so the files in the uh, the video tutorials were empty, and um, when the when I go into the help section of the video browser uh, tutorial library, if I go down to that five star coffee sign tutorial where that folder was empty and everything, and I view that tutorial. I have the option of downloading the files, those tutorial files to my computer. So if I go ahead and download uh, the tutorial files, um, it'll ask if I want to run or save. And in this case, uh, I could run or save. And so I'll go ahead and just hit run. Uh, and what this will do is that once it downloads those files, it'll automatically run the installer. So uh, this is going to take about 12 seconds to download. Uh, these files and uh, four seconds, three seconds, two, one. Once it's done installing, it's going to run a security scan and then all of a sudden it will open up the installer. And the installer, before it opens, it's going to ask for permission to make changes to the software. We would click yes, so on and so forth. So let's give it the second to do that and hopefully we don't get interrupted. Lord of it. Anyway, man, Lord of mercy. Uh, we'll get back to adding wood types and all that stuff. And here we go. So I'm going to click yes. And uh, when I click yes, it asks me, hey, can this program make changes? Uh, we're going to get our welcome to the five star coffee sign tutorial wizard. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click next. Um, and I'm going to click I agree to the license terms and agreement saying, hey, I agree. Uh, and then I'm going to click install and what this is going to do is it's going to put these files and it's going to say hey tutorial successfully added to your user public public documents Vetric files tutorial aspire v9 and all the other folders uh, please refresh your tutorial browser uh, page to access the newly installed file so we're going to click OK let it uh, finish up and it's going to do the same thing I've got aspire I've got vgar pro I've got desktop so it's adding it to every single one of my project files so I'm going to go click OK all the way through that. And for the last one, we'll go through there. You're going to only have one file, most likely, that it will put it in. I have all the software, so it put, it in, it put that tutorial in every single one of those folders. So when I click Finish, I can now come into my uh, File Explorer. Let's make sure I don't get disconnected again. <laughs> uh, I can come into my File Explorer uh, and let's come over here and go to users, public, public documents, Vetric files. And if I go to those tutorial files and all, and I go down to my Vetric vCard Pro, if I go down to that five star coffee sign and I go into the file now, I've got the job files. I've got the Vetric files, the previews and uh, you know everything already there. Now I can open those files up within my software and I can watch that tutorial and work with that tutorial. Okay, so you're going to find those files in your public under users, public, public documents, Vetric files. That's where you'll find those files and everything within Vetric. Okay, now as far as uh, the materials and stuff, um, I can add custom materials to the background and stuff. Uh, can't you put your DFX folders so they show up in your clip art tab within the Vetric 2? Uh, Mickey, good. That's a great question. So if I came in um, to, because I can do my, my, my uh, clip art and images and things, Mickey's asking, can't I add that uh, so I can see that within there? Well, I have library browser and I have local files. And so if I went to my local files library and everything, and I went to my, um, let's grab that uh, DXF folder here uh, that was in my, did I put, let me hear, where did I put my DXF file? Bear with me a second, let me find my DXF file, because yes, you can. Um, tick, 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 downloads. 
and under downloads, I believe. I believe I can. I don't want to do that. I get copyrighted. Hold on a second. Let's see here. I believe. Where the hell did I just put that? Gosh, this is what happens when you get old and lose your mind. Where did I just put that file? It's in my 2008. Oh, it's in. It's not in there. It's in here. Sorry. It's in my J drive. Man, that was driving me nuts. I was like, I knew I just put it in here. So my 2018 files. So, um, and uh, my digital store. That's where that DXF file is. Let's move that to the desktop to make things easier for right now so I don't have to be digging through all these. My desktop. All right. So, within my software, if I go to my desktop here and I find that DXF folder, um, I can right click and I can add that folder to the library right here within the Vetric. And uh, it's going to say, uh, you know, added folder, you know, DXF to the browser library. So when I click OK in my browser library, I now have that DXF file and I can come in and I can, you know, uh, I've got that. But guess what? It's not going to show me the images because you can't see a DXF unless I have a DXF viewer. So that's not going to be a viable option um, for me there, Mickey. So because it's a DXF, there's, it's only going to show images or it's going to show model files, clip art image, you know, clip art and stuff. Um, DXF is not going to show in there within the metric. So that answers that question, doesn't it? It does. It does. You know, so it's not, it'll add it to that library, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't do anything for me, you know? Um, if I go back to my local files and I, you know, uh, try to open that local file, nothing's previewing down here. I'm not going to see anything uh, within that, no matter what section I'm in. So, you know, now my Joy Box uh, class files or, you know, uh, you know, other files, vector files and everything, you know, those vectors and stuff uh, that are there, that it's a CRV file. It'll show my CRV files and all, but it won't show my DXF because I don't have a DXF viewer built into it. Okay. Alrighty, but that's how you would add it to the library if it's something that you could view like all your CRV files you can add that to your quick access you know if you have a CNC jobs folder and you want to be able to pop those up or something you can do that um, and uh, Mickey Good says uh, he believes that SVG files do work um, let's see we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up on this uh, I don't want to get hung up on it too much uh, but if I come over here and grab an SVG file, go into my backup drive and dot SVG. Okay. Ticka ticka derm derm. All right. So. Within my SVG, I've got some bold monograms and stuff. So we'll grab that folder. So if I go to my local files and I go to, let's close up uh, these options here and go to my Seagate. And in my Seagate, if I go down to my, um, Stand by while it, it gets everything loaded. Loaded. Got a lot of things in that backup drive. Yeah. I go in here and I grab my SVG folder and all. No preview there, buddy roll. If I go ahead and add that to my file library and I come in here, my SVG, no preview. Sorry, Mickey. Uh, was hoping that would work for you, but no, it won't. Okay, because I don't have an SVG viewer, I don't have a DXF viewer, EPS viewer, or anything like that. It's going to be images, it's going to be models, it's going to be CRV files, things like that that I can view in here. All right. <clears throat> yeah, to be, I know, right? Um, now, when it comes to uh, adding, let's say let's say I go to uh, onto Google here, and um, let's say I go in and, and type in a, a walnut wood background in old Google, 
and let's go to images and let's see here let's grab I want a high resolution image so let's go to tools that's your uh, Google tools uh, larger than and I'm gonna go 800 by 600 and let it filter those out there we go all right so let's grab this image here let it load that was not the image that I wanted there, buddy row. Very pixelated image. I would not use this image, but uh, what the hell. So we'll save that image and we'll save that as walnut three and Let's move that into the C drive, users, public, public documents, Vetric files, material images, and we'll save that there. And if I were to restart my Vetric software, I should have it in there. I may, I shouldn't have to drop it into the application data folder. Let's find out. Bum, 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 bum. 9.5 and if I come over here and preview we can come in and walnut number three is there and again, very poor image, very pixelated image. I would not use that image. I'll end up deleting it. But anything that's in that preview will get added to the uh, library here, okay, and, and everything. So, but that's a that's a piss poor image. Uh, it's very pixelated and stuff. But you get it, you get it, you get the gist. All right, let's get on past that. So now. Let's talk about our um, view bar and let's talk about our grid and uh, you know snap options and things up here in the top of the view bar. Now, our grid right now, uh, the grid, when I have the grid turned on and, and I see a lot of people when I'm working with them that they, when I, when I go to work with them in their software, they got the grid on all the time. Uh, turn it off when you're not using it uh, because your mouse is always wanting to snap to those points. Now, if you want the grid on because you're using it all the time and you have a specific need for it, great, leave it on. But if you're not using it, if you're freehand drawing and stuff like that or you know what have you, turn that grid off uh, and all. But this grid, the default spacing of these grid dots are a quarter of an inch apart. And we can adjust those spots of the grid by going into the edit menu and down to our snap options. And in the snap options, we have our grid spacing and we can adjust that grid spacing, whatever it may be and everything. And so that will, you know, space that grid out, uh, however we need, however far we need it and stuff. So your snap options are once again, under the edit menu, uh, shortcut is F4 to get to those, but you can adjust those, uh, accordingly in everything. Okay. And, uh, let's click okay on that, you know, for that grid. Now, a lot of people still, uh, you know, I see sometimes where, you know, they might have their smart snapping and their geometry snapping turned off uh, and they have 9.5 and stuff. Um, and that's fine, you know, but if you ever need, uh, you know, you've got these wonderful new snapping tools at your disposal. And what this is, is, you know, let's say I have a rectangle here and let's say that I'm getting ready to draw a circle. Well, with the snapping tools on, my smart snapping and geometry snapping and everything, I can wake up an existing vector. 
I can hover my mouse over a particular point and I can wake that point up and you see that dotted line it gives me and everything you know I got various points so if I want the center of this circle to be at the center you know line of this rectangle I can wake up that point and now it gives me that center line and you know I can you know draw my circle and uh, you know they be perfectly uh, aligned with one another and stuff and everything um, let's say I want the top of my circle to be you know uh, at the top here if I go into let's close this tool if I go into transform mode and you know I come over here I can literally just touch this area here and stuff and it'll give me that line and everything where I can you know reference it and stuff um, and you know the same goes for for circles as well circles is basically you've got arcs and stuff so if I wanted to you know kind of I've got different points and things that I can touch off on that circle uh, to give me you know alignment and stuff let's say I come over here and wake this guy up over here then I've got uh, let's wake him up again come on get on there boy there we go and you know I can align to it that smart snapping and stuff so it just gives us some snapping points and things that we can snap to and all um, if I have Oh, I think, I mean, that's pretty much kind of explains uh, smart snapping and all um, when I'm working with, with it. You know, I can, I can wake up. You don't click on, you just kind of wake up where you want to uh, go to and then I can, you know, snap to that point or whatever it might be and everything. And uh, so it's nice to have that geometry and smart snapping. Now, the smart snapping is snapping to another object. The geometry snapping is uh, going to uh, snap to various points on my board if i've got my circle tool open up i got these snapping points along my material i've got my center um you know i've got my center points here i've got edge snapping points and things that i can work with you know whatever i need to do and everything so and let's cut that out while I'm at. so let's see here um let's pause here for a second uh, Warren asks, will that work in Cut 2D? Uh, Cut 2D uh, should, if you're talking about as far as bringing images in for the preview and stuff, uh, yes, it should work the same, Warren, if that's what you're referring to. Yep, yep. Now, uh, back to the edit options and things. Uh, within our options, within the software, we can set up options within the software. And if, you, if you've got... Uh, let's say you calculate a toolpath and um, here let me do this let me let me go turn off let me turn off my auto 3d open let me change this to no okay all right so if I calculate a toolpath let's let me get let me get a, a, a vector in here all right let's say I'm calculating this toolpath after I'm calculating the toolpath uh, and it stays on this toolpath window, it doesn't take me to the preview window and stuff. If you want that option to be taken right directly to the 3D preview uh, right after a toolpath calculates, but it, it doesn't, you know, you're still sitting in here in your toolpath and stuff, then come up to your edit options, edit options, and then come down to your 3D view. Uh, right here, your toolpath settings, and auto open the 3D view. Change that from no to yes. And what that does is after I calculate a toolpath, it then automatically brings me into the preview toolpath. You know, so I can preview that cut and everything. You know, you know. So uh, if you want to be able to, you know, right after you calculate the toolpath, be taken right into that preview, change that option in your, in your options and all. And, um, you know now tad uh todd is asking about tangent snapping and everything and when we were talking about the smart snapping and stuff we, we have a new function uh within the metric software is our tangents and everything uh the tangents of uh circles and arcs and stuff and the tangent is that perfect transition line uh, of the circle and how we utilize tangents is with our polyline tool our draw polyline tool I can snap to my circle uh, and on the second circle, I don't click, I don't snap, I just hover over that second circle and I hit the letter T on the keyboard. 
it will snap that polyline to the perfect tangent. Now, of course, I'm going to use the space bar to finish that line. And if I come over here and I click here and I hover over this one and hit the letter T and uh, everything, you'll see it snap to that perfect tangent line and everything and uh, space bar to finish. What that does is that gives me that perfect transition, you know, when we're working with tangents and all for that nice smooth transition. And let's, uh, let's get up close and personal with that. Let's draw another circle here. Let's draw another smaller one down here. And let's kind of get up close and personal with this so you can see. With my draw polyline tool, I will click, and it doesn't matter what circle, if I click on this one down here, and I hover over here, and I'm gonna hover kind of up here, so you can see that line crossing over that circle. Now I'm gonna hit the letter T on my keyboard, and you'll see it'll snap that line to that perfect tangent. And then of course, space bar to finish. And again, I could snap up here, and then hover down here, and hit the letter T, and it's gonna snap to that perfect tangent, and space bar to finish that line. And uh, once again, I can come in here and I can, you know, trim that away and stuff for that perfect tangent and all. Okay, so that's the tangent tool. That's the new tangent tool. And that tangents is available now in uh, version 9.5. I believe tangents came out in 9.5. Yep. Okay. All right. So now in our edit options and stuff, there's a lot of options here that we can turn on and turn off. Um, and... Uh, the within our window we can save our tab layout uh, we can save our dialogue layout save our view layout uh, these are different things and you can see what each of those do and stuff um, we can uh, come in and um, in our 3d view settings we can you know change the way our background looks the shaded background you know um, let's do this here's something fun let me open up let me open up a project let's exit out of this and let me open up a project just uh let's see what i've got here something recently that i've worked on digga digga dig into your room oh what would be something i recently worked on Trying to find a picture. Stand by. What would be a good one? Lumberjock plaid. <clears throat> we'll use the lumberjock plaid. It might not be the one I'm thinking of, but. No. That's that's another that's for another day. Uh where's my Take it, take it down, down. Oh, come on. Where's a, I, I know I saved one just recently. This is a good little, fun little thing. Um, son of a gun, give me a picture. The woodworking show plaques. Oh, no, that's that bit. Here it is. Here it is. Fishing design. That's a good one. Just bear with me a second. Let me open this up. Yeah. All right. Now, this opened up in my tool pass in there so I don't have to recreate them. No. Good. Let's take this. And let's copy this and close out of that because it's wanting to open up my older. I got to uh, one of these days get rid of my older software, but I try to keep everything. Uh, I don't know why. Let's go into 9.5, my newer stuff. <clears throat> All right, create a new file. Let's go in and let's go uh, 21 by 11 and a quarter. Three quarters, uh, working off the machine bed, bottom left corner, click OK, and let me paste these files in here and let me center them. F9, keyboard shortcut for centering. All right, there's two things I want to show you here. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to show you. Uh, one, let me create a toolpath. Uh, let me create a toolpath. Let me just do a very simple V-carve toolpath. 
uh, zero start depth, zero flat depth, 60 degree V bit. I'm going to calculate this out. And uh, okay, it needs a flat depth because of that fish's tail and Bob's wanting to write through. So let's go with a flat depth of an eighth of an inch and calculate this out. I'm not going to use a flat area clearance tool because this isn't a tutorial on creating Bob's bait and tackle sign. And we did that once before. Um, all right, so I'm still fueling in that walnut. Let me get to the maple here. All right, now imagine, imagine that um, I'm going to be hanging this sign up in a in in a shop or my customer's home or something like that, and uh, they need uh kind of they, they, it's hard for them to visualize what it would look like and stuff and let this preview out now this is an ugly sign but just bear with me on this so let's say i'm going to hang this up and all that well that customer could send me a picture of their kitchen wall they could send me a picture of their bedroom wall they could send me a picture of you know uh what have you and let's go on google let me find a bedroom wall or something uh, i don't have a picture just laying around of a bedroom wall uh and stuff but let me grab one just to show this uh fun little thing that we can do within vetric uh, let's see here. Uh, we'll do kitchen wall. B kitchen wall. How about B? How about kitchen wall? Not B kitchen wall. Let's go kitchen wall. I don't. I want an A kitchen wall, not a B kitchen wall. Now, if I go into images, and of course, uh, credit where credit is due to uh, the fine folks that uh, created these images. I'm just using it for a brief moment. Uh, but let me find a kitchen wall that has some blank space on it. Uh, tbooks.net. Visit tbooks.net. Uh, you know. But let's go ahead and pop in here. And let's save this image. Just for demonstration purposes. We're going to save this uh, on my desktop. And click OK. Now, one of the cool things that I can do is... Um, Within the software, within the edit options, I can come into my shaded background style and everything, and I can change that from a solid view to a gradient view, which is by default, it's a gradient, but I can also change it to an image. And so I can add an image in here, and then on my image file path, I can type in that file path. And uh, for me, the file path of that image if I go to my desktop here and I find that uh, wonderful little kitchen wall here and everything and uh, let's um, go into its properties and drum, 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 right here's the path copying I'm gonna paste that path up here. I'm gonna put a forward slash in front of it. Um, oh, okay, hold on a second, that's not gonna work. Let me do this differently. I'm gonna rename this to kitchen. <laughs> kitchen. Trying to make things simple for me today. Okay, so this, uh, the path, if I go into the properties here, the path is, uh, you know, C, users, Laney, desktop, and then kitchen, right? So let me copy that. All right, in my, uh, let's close this. Right here in my path, I can go ahead and paste that in there. And then let me put that forward slash kitchen. And that kitchen image was a JPEG, I believe. We do need that file extension. Very important. Um, and, uh, Let's go into my desktop and that kitchen is a jpeg.jpg. Okay, so if I go in here back into my Vetric, uh, let's get that kitchen.jpg. All right, and I click OK. Now all of a sudden that kitchen is gonna be my background, right? And I can take old Bob's uh, sign here and uh, you know I can hold down my control key and let's uh, let's hang that up on the wall and size that appropriately uh, and everything. Let's turn that about how it would uh, be. Oops, there we go. Hold down my control key and let's go hang that up on the wall up here. And I can kind of give them a visual of what their what their sign would look like in their home. 
you know and of course this is a close-up view of the kitchen and all that stuff but you can kind of get that general idea it's a fun little thing um and, and all uh, that we can do um mike there is a cheat sheet for all the keyboard shortcuts and stuff uh up in the help section not to digress uh help keyboard shortcuts and everything uh, but when it comes to this, uh, that's what this basics tutorial is all about. Okay. And, um, you know, is uh, giving, you know, these instructions and stuff and all. But, you know, I could, I could send, I could save this preview image now. I could save this preview image and I could email it to the customer and say, hey, here's what your sign is going to look like. You want to change the wood? Do you want to change the, the, the layout? Do you want to change anything like that? And it's something fun that we can do, you know. So it's a really neat thing, uh, you know, and everything. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you and stuff. It's kind of a neat little thing to do. All right, so let's go back and I'm going to go back into my edit options and I'm going to go into my options and I'm going to change that back uh, from an image, that shaded uh, background style. I'm going to change that from an image to a gradient and everything and click OK and get back to my you know uh, white background here because I don't have a gradient set up. I got a white background. <clears throat> and uh, But I wanted to share that. Some fun that you could do, you know, if you need to, if you need to give them a really a, a um, uh, kind of a kind of a preview simulation of what it's like. So you know, hey, um, I really just can't picture it. Uh, you know, and they're having a hard time and decision all. You can go to their home and take the images, or you can have them send you images and stuff. And uh, even if they're a little crooked, you can skew the image. You know, to hang on the wall perfectly and all and all that stuff. But it's something neat and fun that you can do uh, to kind of give them that visual. You know, that visual and stuff. And everything uh, even if we you know we're taking pictures of a custom board that we're gonna carve in and uh, you know we take and we we save that custom board uh, in our folder here we can you know we can drop that in our preview and we can actually look uh, and, and carve that preview on that board you know that's sitting on your workbench you can literally carve it so they can kind of get a virtual realization of what it would look like and uh, you know if you're gonna paint it and everything and add some color or what have you to it and all that stuff and of course this I would never do a sign like this with all these tool marks and stuff in it but you get the idea right so something fun that we can do alrighty now good stuff okay let's see here is there anything else within the options notes notes now for those of you that have a digital wood carver and you have a post processor that uh, puts notes uh, and things within the post processor what I mean by that is um, let's see if I can find a latest toolpath slash post processor file give me a second um, go to documents Needs something that I just recently have uh, done. Desktop, cookbook, textures, transformation, woodworking show plaques. Let me open up this one here. All right. So if you're using the latest post processors, uh, if, if you're a digital woodcarver customer and you're using the latest post processor, or whatever, you're, you know, if you're not a digital woodcarver customer, if your post processor has these file details, section at the top of the post processor generally there is a note section that's what this blank line is right here this blank space is designed for a note you know and um you know the, yeah absolutely uh todd great selling tool now uh is designed for a note so where would that note come from well if i'm in my vetrix software here under edit and i have notes uh let's say i want to make a note of this um uh let's say that uh this gets carved on the uh, walnut slab on the workbench. Let's say I'm leaving a note for one of the guys. This gets carved on the walnut slab that's on the workbench or something, right? Uh, and everything, and and all. And I let's let's go over and save this toolpath. And I'll save this toolpath. It doesn't matter which one of these I save in, but let's go ahead and save this toolpath. And let's save it right on the desktop here, and we'll just call it uh, Old Bob's Bait. 
Now, if I go look at that toolpath file, that which what they would see when they open it up in the controller program, if I go and open this up, you will see that we now have a note that's placed in the, uh, the, the details of that file. You know, it gives them the material size. It gives them where they're starting from, where they're touching off. It gives them their home start position and everything. But it also gives them this note, this custom note, uh, you know, that uh, this gets carved on the walnut slab on the workbench, you know, type of thing and everything. So if your post processor has those uh, file details and things in them, and the digital woodcarver customers, your new post processors do have these file details at the top of the uh, G code, then you can add notes, you know, custom notes for the, that, that may pertain to this job, to this file, to this whatever. And uh, those notes will appear in the file detail section of that G code of that toolpath when you save it. Okay. All right. Cool. All righty. Okay, let's close this and let's get rid of old um, Bob's here for a moment. All right. Now, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's happening up here in our view bar and things. Um, we have the ability uh our view bar right now when we're in single sided view you know a single sided job and stuff there's nothing over here but our layers and we're going to talk about layers in a minute i want to kind of really get into layers here in just a second but we have our layers but we have our you know our snap options are here we have our our pan and zoom tools and stuff and you know the the pan and zoom tools uh, your first zoom tool is a zoom window, meaning that you're going to literally draw a window around the area that you want to zoom into. That middle magnifying glass brings your whole workpiece back into full screen view. And the uh, last magnifying glass with the pink dot is zooming in now to the selected object, whatever object or objects are selected. Now, also, we have our mouse, you know, wherever that mouse is pointing, you know, we're typically going to zoom in to that area, wherever that mouse is be, that's, and I roll that wheel on the mouse, that's typically where I'm going to zoom into and stuff. But aside from the zoom and stuff, we have, we, we have things that we can toggle on and off. And uh, our, our toolpath visibility is, is a big thing. So let's say that I create a profile toolpath on this, and uh, let's say that I'm cutting on the outside, but I have an allowance of a negative uh, 0.125, an eighth of an inch allowance on this cut and everything, about half my bit basically. Well, when I'm looking in the 2D view, uh, when you see these little arrows and lines and things, that means a toolpath is visible. That means over in your toolpath, you have a toolpath checked. So you can always come over and uncheck that if, if need be. But you also have the ability to turn that visibility on and off up here in the view bar. So we can turn that toolpath visibility on and off here. Now, when you're looking at the wireframe view within the, uh, the, the software and stuff, that is a showing you where the center of that bit is cutting and what direction that bit is cutting in. So is it gonna be cutting in a counterclockwise or clockwise direction? You might be wanting to do a climb cut versus a conventional. And we'll get into climb cuts and conventionals in another class. But let's say that I wanted to make sure that my offset allowance was in the right direction. Well, I can toggle from that wireframe to a solid view. And now I'm getting the full diameter of that quarter inch bit. Uh, and you can see that I'm over my line here by that eighth of an inch. If my offset allowance was a positive number, let's say that um, I'm at a positive sixteenth of an inch. Well, that means that I'm cutting away from that line by a 16th of an inch. Okay, positive is away from the vector. Uh, negative is over or towards. So now I'm cutting on the outside of the cut and I'm in a profile toolpath here and I have a positive allowance. Well, if I set that and change that to a negative allowance, that means I'm letting that bit cross over that line by that 16th of an inch. Now, that's on the outside of the cut, right? Well, let's go and let's look at this profile toolpath if I was cutting on the inside of the cut and I'm doing a negative allowance. Negative allowance still means that I'm cutting over the line, okay? Anytime you're going over the line, it's a negative. If that allowance was a, I'm on the inside of the cut now, but if that allowance was a positive number, 
that allowance was a positive number, I'm gonna be away from that line. I'm gonna be a 16th of an inch more inside that cut away from the line. So when you're going away from the line, you know, whether you're on the outside of the cut or the inside of the cut, when you're going away from the line, that's, an, that's a positive number. When you're going over the line or, you know, letting it kind of cross over, that's a negative number. It doesn't matter if you're in, in inside of the vector or outside of the vector. Negative is over the line. Okay? Positive is away from the line. All right? So a lot of people get that and they're kind of confused as the when, when should it be a negative offset and when should it be a positive offset stuff but we can preview that you know here's our wireframe model which really doesn't show us much it doesn't tell us you know if my if I've got that you know if I was doing an overcut by a few thousands of an inch it was an inlay type of thing I wanted to fit just perfect and all uh, the wireframes not telling me it's just telling me where the center of my bit is gonna be in the direction that it's gonna be cutting and all but I can switch over to that solid view and I can see my allowance and in this case I'm in a positive allowance here okay so you've got that solid uh, view or wireframe that you can toggle, okay? Now, when you're in the 3D view and everything, right now we have our, our, our block, you know, our, our block and stuff. And let me close this. Um, when we're in the 3D view and everything, and uh, let's turn off that tool path. Oops, not there. In the 3D view, you uncheck it here. Um, if for some reason that I needed to outline my material block, uh, I can turn that visibility on off, uh, as well. And that what that does is that gives me the virtual green lines here. Uh, it shows my virtual block outline and stuff and everything and all. And, uh, you know, there may be, uh, you know, you may need to do that. You know, there may be a purpose for you having to do that and stuff and everything um, for your virtual block. There we go. Now... <clears throat> One of the things that people may not know is, is we have the ability to, to tile our windows, our 3D view and our 2D view. You saw me, I'm switching back and forth from 3D to 2D view, but we can tile those windows side by side or one on top of the other and stuff. So I can work in the 2D view and stuff and I can see my 3D view down here. And this is handy when we actually have a 3D model uh, within the design and stuff. Um, when I have a 3D model, and let's, uh, we'll take, I don't know why I got this thing for fish or what have you, but, um, and when I'm working, when I'm working with these tiled windows, I can work in the 3D window or I can work in the 2D window. It doesn't matter uh, and stuff. And so I can tile these windows uh, one on top of the other or side by side. Okay, so we've got that and everything. Now, let's get rid of that uh, model. Let's get rid of the circle and let's, get into uh, something out oh not that uh, maximize how to get out of this tile view oh gosh how do I get out of the tile view you maximize one or the other view whichever one you want to go into so I'm going to maximize my 2d view and that'll bring me back to my normal tab state here okay all right maximize now Let's talk about layers. Layers is, you know, uh, people still have a hard time with layers. Uh, they, they still, they, they wonder, does layers have to do with depth of cut? Uh, does layers have to do with tool pass and cut order and things? Uh, you know, does layers have to do with um, anything? What, what is layers, you know? They, they you know, not know. Well, layers, think of it like a, a stack of translucent, uh, translucent papers. Um, and the translucent papers are stacked on top of each other and I've got my whole design there but I've got things separated on different layers and I can turn those visibility of those things on and off so let's say that um, let's say I've got a border here and let's take and draw a border draw a boundary and I'm gonna um, offset that boundary inward uh, let's go one inch with sharp corners and I'm going to take and on that boundary, I'm going to go back into my rectangle tool and I'm going to change it and give myself a little bit of a decorative border here with a three quarter inch radius corners. Okay. All right. Let's say I've got some text in here. So uh, and let's change this text size to one inch. And let's say that uh, I've got a
bass in here, right? I got another object, whatever the case may be. All right. Now, as my design starts getting more and more and more involved, uh, you know, with, 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 with a variety of things, whatever they may be, um, I can start to separate some of these things by layers. And notice how uh, I've got a layer here called Artboard. And Artboard was uh, created when I imported that DWG. That DWG file that I imported earlier was on a layer called Artboard when it was created. It was the Artboard of, of Adobe Illustrator. And so that layer was created for me uh, when I imported that DWG file. Now that layer stayed active and everything that I've drawn and everything ever since has been in, put into that layer. So all everything is in that layer. And so what I want to do is uh, I'm going to take and select everything here. And I'm going to move, I'll right click, I'm going to move it to layer one. And let's go into our layers tab over here on the left. It's the same as this drop down menu, but we have it over here on the left as well. But now I've got these blank sheets. So if you see next to layer one, there's a little graphic there on that little sheet of paper. That means there's data on that layer. And then next to layer zero and artboard, they're empty sheets. That means there's nothing, there's no data on there. They're empty. And typically if there's nothing on there, then we're gonna delete and get rid of those, okay? But let's say that this job is my master template here and I, the only thing that changes in this job uh, may be uh, a date, a name, you know, names or something like that. Um, one of the things I could do is, uh, you know, on my master layer here, I can go ahead and create a new layer, add a new layer, and I'll just call this my uh, date layer. Okay. And uh, let's create a new layer here and we'll call this uh, text layer. Okay. And um, the bass and the border, the, the borders and all, they stay the same. So that's going to be my master template. And uh, let's take and let's get rid of this uh, circle here. And in my text layer with it active, should be able to read it up here and if I look at it, it's highlighted in bold I'm gonna add some more text and it's gonna be you know the names or, or date or what have you so uh, this will be uh, you know uh, Joan and Dave you know whatever it might be now on my master layer, I'm going to take uh, my text here, all of my text, and that's going to get moved over to that text layer. I want to make sure all of my text is on that text layer. And now I can, you know, I can turn that layer on and off to hide those, those objects and stuff. Um, my date layer, I don't have any date in here right now. So uh, let's go ahead and make our date layer active. And let's come in and just throw in a date. We'll throw in a date right here and we'll call this uh, March 25th, 2018 and everything. Now, when I created that, it automatically put it in the date layer because that's the layer that was active. Now, I said my, my layer one, I'm gonna rename this. Is, this is gonna be my master uh, template, you know, whatever it is. And now on that master template, I'm going to go into the file here and I could do this in the layer tab or in the drop down here, but I'm gonna go into this little document file right here and I have the choice of doing some things. Uh, and one of the things I have is, is locking this layer. So now if we look at that layer in the left side and if we drop it down, you see there's a little padlock next to the light bulb. It's locked, it's protected. That means that anything on that layer, I cannot select. And no matter what I do, I cannot select anything on that layer. It's protected, it's locked. And so now my template is intact. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, it's not gonna, I'm not worried about, you know, when I go in and change this, these people's names and date or what have you, that it's gonna mess up my original layout of my template and stuff. Because I'm either gonna be working in my, you know, uh, and let's let's be a little bit more specific with this. Uh, instead of text layer, we'll call this our name layer. And you know, if I can go in now, I can go in and I can adjust you know that name and stuff. But you want to make sure if you're going to make any changes 
that that layer is active, that it's highlighted in bold when you're making those changes. Otherwise, those changes could be thrown to another layer that is active. But now I've got this master template protected and everything. So that's one of the things that we can do. We can lock and unlock you know, a layer. Now it's unlocked. I can select anything that's on that layer and stuff. So it's not protected anymore. Um, we can hide, you know, we can hide, uh, you know, hide this layer. You know, we can, we can hide that layer. It's basically the same as clicking on the light bulb to turn that layer on and off and stuff. Uh, we can um, merge visible layers into one. Uh, you know, uh, visible layers into one. So if I if I came over here and I um, turned off the uh, just had the name and the the master layer and stuff here, I could come in and I could merge those uh, visible layers, and uh, it will put them together in one. So now they're all on one, and then my date is on another by itself type of deal. And uh, of course, I can come in and I can undo that. So I don't want to do that right now, but I could merge those layers together if they kind of belong together, what have you. Now, one of the things that uh, you know um, I can do within this menu is I can select the layers vectors. So uh, if I hit select layer vectors, it's going to select all the vectors on that layer. You know, so I can I can kind of work with these little menus and stuff in here to do some things. But here's the deal. Here's where where it comes really interesting. When I'm creating a tool path within the software, I can associate a toolpath with a layer. And so if I come in in here, I want to make sure that all of my layers are turned on and I come over to my toolpath and stuff. And let's say on my profile toolpath, okay, uh, or my V carve toolpath or whatever the case may be. In this case, it would be a V carve toolpath. Um, I can associate this toolpath and on this one, it's going to be the bass. Uh, and uh, the border. I'm going to limit that cut to an eighth of an inch. So I've got my uh, 60 degree V bit. I'll go ahead and throw in a flat uh, area uh, uh, bit as well uh, because that's going to. Um, I need to do this. Bass and border. The border needs to be moved to a new layer called the border layer because I don't want those two together. Border layer. There we go. Now. Let's first of all, let's look at these little black boxes next to it and then we'll come back to associate. Uh, let's give these colors, you know, so uh, my master uh, template, uh, those vectors are going to be kind of a maroon. Uh, I've got uh, kind of a orange going on for the date layer. Uh, my name layer, let's give that a kind of a green. And then my border layer, we'll give that a bright red and stuff. And so I can separate those layers by colors as well. So I can see that all of these different things are on different layers. Now. Back to that toolpath. So let's go to that VCar toolpath, and I'm going to limit this cut to an eighth of an inch. And um, this is going to be the bass, my master uh, uh, template, and everything. Now, one of the um, things is is uh, 60 degree V bit. I want a flat area clearance tool uh, for this. So I'm going to go ahead and select the flat area clearance tool. It's going to be an eighth inch end mill. And now down here. I have my vector selection and right now it's set to manual, meaning I manually come over here and select whatever it is that's getting selected. In this case, it's going to be the bass, not the border. I don't want the border selected. It's going to be just the bass and stuff. I can manually select that vector and I can calculate that toolpath, right? Okay. But let's do it a little bit more, a little better. Let's go in and use our vector selector and let's take and select all the open vectors and let's get back to a 2d view so you can see what happens in the 2d view let's uh turn off these tool paths here and um on this tool path if i use my selector i want to select all the open and closed vectors uh, and i want to associate these vectors with a tool path this tool path this particular tool path i'm calculating right now and I want to associate the vectors. I could do all the visible layers, right? Anything that's turned on, I could just select that and it would select all of them. But I want the master template, okay? I want it to associate this toolpath with every vector that's on the master template. And I'm going to click close and it's now going to say automatic. And so notice how it selected the bass here and that's my master template. And I'm going to hit calculate. Now let's go ahead and create our profile toolpath. And on the profile toolpath, I'm going to use that same 60 degree V bit. 
and uh, eighth inch depth cut is fine. I want to be on the line on this, on the line, and I'm going to come into my selector and I'm going to associate. I'm going to associate this um, with every vector that's on the border vector, and click OK. And if I come in here, you'll see that border vector is selected now. We can calculate that, and on and on and on. Well, now what what does this do for me? And let's do one last one. Let's do our text. Uh, let's go with a V carve, and uh, no flat depth on this. 60 degree V bit. Let's go into our selector and associate this with everything that's on the name and date layer. So notice how it selected everything that's on the name and date layer, and we'll calculate that. Now I've got these and everything, and I've got the toolpath calculated. And let's get rid of this profile. It doesn't need to be here now. Uh, and if I preview all the tool paths, you know, we've got that, but let's say, okay, you know, I've got the tool paths calculated now and I want to go over there and I want to make a change. Okay. Uh, Joan and Dave, uh, you know, Dave ended up running off with the bridesmaid and now we have, uh, you know, um, Joan and Mike or whatever the case may be. So let's go in here and let's change this. That wouldn't be a good scenario, but anyway, let's go into our text and let's change this. Uh, to um, Barbara and Steven. Now, once I've done that, all I have to do is recalculate all the toolpaths. Okay, I've got this little button here for recalculating all the toolpaths. Those toolpaths are associated with all the vectors uh, with those layers and so it automatically recalculated them and it recalculated the new names and stuff so if I come into my view and I reset this preview and stuff uh, and then I preview all the tool paths and everything now I've got my um, you know uh, Barbara and, and Steven and everything so all I have to do is just you know those those tool paths are associated with vectors that are on particular layers and if I make a change in one of those layers and I recalculate the toolpath, that, that toolpath recalculation will capture those changes and automatically update them. So, okay. Um, all right. So, when it, Tippy, when a layer is locked, when a layer is locked, you can't add, you can't select, you can't do anything. So, uh, Tippy's asking the question of if I have a locked layer, let's say that my bass layer here, my master template, let's lock that. All right. And let's say that that's my active layer here and stuff. And that layer is locked. All right. So if I wanted to come in and, uh, you know, uh, draw and everything, will that add that vector to that layer, even though it's locked? Well, Let's click uh, apply and close and looky looky. So you see what happened. It added it, but I can't reselect it to edit, change, or do anything with it. Okay. It dropped it on there, but I can't do anything with it. If I didn't draw it the right size or whatever, then I do have to come up and I do have to unlock that layer so I can, you know, come in and edit it and, and change whatever you know it is supposed to be blah 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 but as long as the layer is locked you can still add stuff to it but you can't so once you once it's there it's there it's locked it's protected the minute that it's created uh, we can't do anything more with it uh, and stuff um, and everything uh, so we would have to unlock that layer if we had to do any editing to that shape name whatever it might be and everything so uh, once that tool is closed and everything, you know, it won't let me, you know, select that object. There's nothing I can do. It's there type of deal and stuff. So we can add to it, but we can't. Once it's added, it's added. It's, it's, it's in there. It's now it's, it's, it's under the protection of the lock and everything. Now, if a layer is locked, can I associate a tool path with it? Yeah. So if I go in, oh gosh, I got the hiccup. Sorry. If I go into my VCart toolpath here and um, let's uh, go into the selector and I choose uh, associate with a toolpath with this locked layer, I can still, uh, you know, associate with that. That's my template and stuff. 
and I can calculate, you know, uh, that layer and stuff. So I, even though it's locked, it's protecting me from making changes during the drawing or the editing phase and things like that. It's my template and all that stuff. Um, but I can still associate a toolpath with it. I can still associate a toolpath with it and all that. Uh, so we don't have to unlock it just to create a toolpath. It's, it's just, it's the locked, it's protected and all that. But we can still, we can add to it, you know, if we need to. But once we add it, it's there and we can create a toolpath on it. Okay. And when a toolpath is associated with a layer, that's, it's a wonderful thing because, you know, when I come in and let's go into my um, border layer and let's take this border and uh, let's do uh, square corners with it and let's go into my uh, name layer and uh, let's go in and um, let's get rid of this and delete that and stuff. And I come back in and just simply hit recalculate all toolpaths. It's going to recalculate those toolpaths and stuff. And they're all successfully recalculated. And so now if I come back into my uh, view and stuff, it's, you know, it's going to um, come in and, and uh, recalculate based on what happened to that layer and stuff. And all. So, uh, so I really want you guys, layers is a great way to separate things in your design. It's a great way to kind of protect your master templates. If you have a wedding sign or something that's uh, going to change and stuff, uh, you know, dates and names and stuff like that, but the main outline of the design is not, make that your master template or whatever you want to call it and, um, you know, uh, create that, create that toolpath and stuff and all. Um, can layers be resequenced? Yeah, David, they sure can. Uh, what David's asking is, can layers be, you know, changed around? Just like, just like toolpaths can be resequenced, layers can as well. So when we're working with layers and stuff, you're going to be in your layer tab uh, here down below your layer tab, and you've got your two arrows here, and so you can move layers uh, wherever you need to position them at uh, within your your list. You know, you can you can resequence them and stuff. Uh, you know wherever wherever you want them to fall and everything and that'll update here you know but I can't drag you know layers around in this drop down I have to be in my layer list to resequence those and everything okay um, no Ronnie you do not have to lock all the layers before carving on the machine it has nothing to do uh, you know, locking is just protecting it from when you're drawing. So understand, locking a layer, locking a layer is just protecting you from making changes to anything on that layer while you're drawing. So I don't screw up my bass and grab some, you know, if I were, you know, let's see here, let's unlock this layer. Okay, let's unlock this layer. All right, let's say that uh, I'm coming in here and I wanna, I'm trying to drag, grab this circle, right? And I, instead of clicking on it, I decide to draw a big old window around it, right? And, um, you know, I was gonna go delete it. And when I delete it, well, I accidentally grabbed some of the stuff on my bass and I deleted it, uh, you know, as well. It's like, well, shoot. Well, it had that, had that uh, bass, and let's move this over to a layer that's not locked. Um, had that bass layer my master layer here been locked and stuff and I come in to grab that circle it doesn't matter how far my box is over that bass it's only grabbing that circle when I hit delete delete you know I'm not selecting something and accidentally deleting and losing something within my design because it's protected type of deal you know what I mean so it has nothing you do not have to lock layers before carving on the machine uh, and uh, any of that stuff, it has nothing to do with that. Okay, it's just protecting it while you're in the design phase. Okay. Well, it's getting to be about 9 o'clock here and everything, and, um, you know, uh, I want to uh, briefly uh, talk to you uh, a little bit on, um, I think layers, we kind of pretty much got those nailed down, you know, and stuff and I really want to emphasize layers because a lot of people don't utilize them or don't utilize them to their full extent uh, associating them with tool paths and making it easier when they make changes in something 
and everything. But be sure now, be sure that a layer is active when you're working on it. And let's let me reiterate this last point on layers, and then we're going to move on. Um, let's say uh, Barbara and Steve here. Now Barbara and Steve is on the name layer, but let's say I've got my border layer active by mistake, and you know me, I do this all the time. I'm working in a layer, and uh, you know uh, everything is uh, everything. Well, let's let's turn off that border layer, right? Now notice what happened when I turn it off. My, that layer is red. In red text saying, boom, red, red. Hey, hey, I'm not visible, but I'm active. Do you sure you want me to be active? You know, I'm not I'm not visible, but I'm active. So it's like it's like, oh, do I need to make another layer that I'm working in active? But let's say it let's say it was. Okay, let's say this layer is turned off. Now let's say I'm working with Barbara and Steve here, and let's say I want to uh, kind of manipulate Barbara and Steve in some way, and I go into and I convert Barbara and Steve from text to a, a curved object, you know, a vector object, and I click on this tool, okay, and let's say I come in here and uh, change around. You see what happened? Do you see what? Uh, did it happen too fast for you? Do you see the border just popped back up on the screen? Now I just had that border layer turned off and invisible. All right, so now wait a minute. What color is that red, right? And, and the name layer is green. Barbara and Steve were green just a moment ago. Well, they're red now. They just got thrown onto that layer because that layer was active when I, was, when I, when I made this change to this vector. So now Barbara and Steven are no longer on the name layer where they should be. They're on a whole nother layer because I wasn't paying attention and I had my border layer active when I was drawing on. So let's go ahead and let's undo that. Okay, so now we're back in, you know, with uh, Barbara and Steve on the name layer, borders on the border layer, and everything is all good. All right, so now I want to make sure that my layer is active, active when I'm making a change. So let's go ahead and convert uh, Barbara and them and let's, uh, you know, we've converted that text, let's size it up and everything, and everything is still golden. I'm still green, I'm still on my name layer because every change I just made was on that layer, okay? Was on that active layer. But when I had, when I wasn't paying attention and I had my border layer active and I started to make changes in the design, all of a sudden every change that I made got thrown, all those vectors got put onto that active layer. And now my nice organization of separation and stuff has been, out the window and I have to undo to get back to it or you know make you know copy and move and things like that okay all right now let's talk about one last thing <clears throat> let's undo this back to uh, solid text here and I want to talk about um, grouping and and, and and ungrouping and things um, and objects and stuff now when I let's let's go in and let's select these two objects here and I'm going to uh, let's see here let's take and make let's let's make the border layer active and let's turn off the border layer for a moment we're gonna make it active something we wouldn't do but we are now I've got now I've got you know Barbara and Steven and everything and all and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, right click on the menu and I'm gonna group these objects okay I'm gonna group them together so they are one you see what happened the minute that I grouped them it put them right on that active layer you know it, it, it took them right off the layers that they were on now my, my both of my layers are empty because all the data is on top of that layer so it's very important everything that we do uh, make sure that we're working in the active layer and that's the last time I'm gonna say that let me undo that um, and let's get back to where we were but I just really need to iterate that make sure and I'm bad about it you've seen you if you've watched any of my classes and you know me and all of a sudden I, I'm, I, I ungroup something or I convert something or what have you. And you see all this stuff pop up on the screen. I'm like, oh, you know, it's because I wasn't working in the active layer. Okay, make sure if you do have layers and you are making changes, make sure that layer is active. And active means you can read the name up here and it's highlighted in black bold text. You know, it's the active layer. Okay, and you activate a layer by clicking on it. Okay, all right.
Okay. Alrighty. All right. So I think we got layers down, and let's. Uh, thanks, Lainey. I got it. Ronnie's like, I got it. Jeez. Um, all right. That's one crappy thing about layers. <laughs> yeah, Todd, it is. Uh, but it just kind of gets it. Get you know, it, we got to keep things separate and stuff. Um, let's pause here for a minute. I've been talking a lot. Let's pause here and let's answer a couple of questions. So, um, uh, Rebecca Schultz says, I think I figured this out as I was, uh, rewording my question, but could you clarify the difference between closing open vectors and joining vectors? Okay. Um, I assume an open vector is just that a single vector that needs to be closed. Uh, when there's more than one and they cannot be connected together to close them, they're actually doing a join, correct? And yeah, and so um, let's draw out a rectangle. Let's draw out a line. And let's draw out a, or that's a square, not a line, but uh, let's draw out a, uh, you know, a rectangle now. And on this rectangle, I'm gonna come in and uh, I'm gonna go into node editing and I'm going to uh, cut the vector here and I'm gonna just slide this node back a little bit. Okay, so we have a small opening there. Uh, on this one here, I'm going to come in and I'm gonna just cut it there, cut the vector here and I'm not gonna slide anything so it still looks like a closed vector. And uh, then, uh, one last one here. Let's grab another square here. And on this one, let's go into node editing. Notice how every vector I put on the screen, um, notice how every vector I put on the screen is turning orange because I'm in that date layer, right? That's what color my date layer is um, and everything. So it's throwing it on those on those layers. All right, so now I have essentially four open vectors here, okay? And uh, so I have the option to join, join open vectors. I have the option of joining or closing an open vector with a straight line, joining or closing a vector with a smooth curve, or joining and closing a vector by bringing the endpoints, the two ends of that vector, to a common point of intersection. Now, when we are joining a vector, an open vector, um, typically we have a tolerance, okay? How, how big our tolerance is, the gap, you know, that it's gonna look for. And so if I were to select this rectangle over here, I have one open vector, and because my tolerance is four thousandths of an inch, um, it's not going to give me the option to join it. My gap is too big, okay? So I can't just simply join it. I've got to close this vector. I can't join it. But now let's grab this one instead, and notice because the, the lines are so close together where they cut, it falls within my four thousandths of an inch tolerance, and now I have one open vector selected, but I can... I can now join this and close it. You know, I can join it together and close it because the lines are within my tolerance. All right. Well, let's say I change my tolerance and everything. Um, and let's let before I do that, let me let me really emphasize this. And we're going to do this one here. Uh, I'm going to come into my join here and I'm going to change my tolerance and I'm going to change it to uh, let's go an eighth of an inch. Oops. Too many decimal points. Okay, now uh, within that eighth of an inch, uh, that does not fall. It's too big. It will not. It's still not finding it. Right. Still an open vector. So okay, let's go ahead and change it to a quarter of an inch. All right. Too many decimal points. Let's get rid of one of them. All right. Still too big. It's not finding it. It's not going to let me join this. And okay, so now I'm going to increase it. And let's go a half inch. You know, now, okay, now it's found this vector and stuff, and it's going to give me the chance to join. Well, here's the deal with that. This is supposed to be a rectangle, okay? And if I, if I increase my tolerance too much and I hit join, look what happens to my rectangle. It said, okay, and it just moved that line over to...
we got to pause for a minute because uh, okay, stand by. We got to pause for a minute because um, uh, the stream lost connection for a moment. Okay, we're back to good. I don't know what man. Yeah. Streams killing. So it, it 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 you know it moved my it moved my rectangle, and that's not what I want. And everything. So what I need to do is I need to join, and I have a choice: join with a straight line, join with a smooth curve, or join by bringing the two endpoints together. And so in this case, it's most likely my best option is going to be joining with a straight line. Okay, so it joins and closes it with a straight line. And um, you know, if I were to choose join with a smooth curve, then that's going to kind of give me a, a little bit of a curvature. It won't be, you know, kind of a straight line. There'll be a little bit of a curvature there with that node. I don't want that. Uh, and if I join by bringing the two endpoints together, well, that's exactly what I did with the last time with the with the close. So if I close, you know, uh, join or slash close. So for me on this one here, that's going to be joining with a straight line. That's going to be one of my best options. Okay. Uh, over here, uh, same thing, way too big. Definitely don't want to put a big old tolerance in my join tool, so I'm going to join this one with a straight line. And then, of course, this one over here, I can use my join tool and I can turn my tolerance back down to my default, and that will let me close that one up and stuff. Now I'm left with this line, okay? There's, there's you know, if I try to join or close this with a straight line, um, then what's going to happen is, is it's going to, you know, uh, not do anything. Uh, it, you know, it, or it's, if I try to join with a smooth curve, you know, it's not going to do anything for me. It's not going to close this off in any way. Uh, it's a straight line. There's two endpoints and stuff. They're, they're not, uh, ability to wrap together. If I try to join by bringing the two endpoints together, it's not going to do anything, you know, um, you know, it's not it's not a vector that I can close unless let's say this line came up and over this way and uh, you know now and let's make sure these are connected let me kind of connect these together I'm gonna join these two together oops I'm gonna join these two together okay now, if I have this here, now my endpoints, my lines are in the same direction and stuff, uh, and I join with a straight line. It's gonna, it, it'll, it'll draw that vector, right? Because they're, they're kind of, they, 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 they're heading in the right direction. I can join this with a smooth curve, you know, uh, you know, create that smooth curve. I can join this uh, by bringing the two endpoints together to a common point of intersection and stuff, you know. But uh, as a straight line, those endpoints are facing opposite directions. I can't join them or anything. You know, I have to place them around. So that's that. We're 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 when they're they're close and everything, we're joining them. Uh, if they're too far away, don't increase your tolerance too much because it distorts the shape a bit and everything, and it might not be what you want. All right, so let's. Um, Let's see here. Your explanation of finding open vectors last week helped me greatly, but I kept hitting a wall when I would try to close a vector and it needed to be joined and the confusion set in. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, Rebecca, that very brief explanation helped. Uh, Todd, uh, does it just extend a line or, or, or add a line? Um, it basically, if I was, if I was closing like on that rectangle, if I had that, uh, rectangle here and I had that rectangle open, let's, uh, cut the vector here and let's pull that back. Okay. It's basically the same as using my extend tool, um, which is this guy right here, a wonderful tool, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about it here in a second. Uh, but uh, the extend tool, it's extending this line out to this point. Now, with my extend tool, 
by doing that, if we look, um, I have one open vector. It just extended that line. It did not close it, even though it connected, extended this line to this point. That's all it did. It extended to that. Okay, so uh, when we were talking about the extend tool, um, with the extend tool, it extend the line, but it will not join at that corner. So it extended that line out to the other line, but it did not connect them at the corner. So when you're using your extend tool, you're extending the line from point A to B, but it's not connecting them. Okay, and uh, to answer your question, uh, Todd, no, there's no extra nodes. If we look here, uh, there were no extra nodes created uh, when it uh, when it extended and everything. Okay, and I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, Streamlabs, uh, I'm going to be spending this week looking for another uh, streaming platform. Uh, Streamlabs is not uh, not cutting the cheese. And if anybody from Streamlabs is watching, get your crap together, boys. It's an open source platform, and just can't trust it. Can't trust it anymore. I'm getting too much, too much. It's disconnecting me. All right. So, let's see here. Um, Sylvia says, so what do you do if you have a lot of open vectors uh, on, let's say, that owl drawing and everything, and, uh, you know, she got a lot of open vectors? Well, unfortunately, uh, you've got to go through and you've got to close them. You've got to, you know, if let's, let's take a look at the bass, for instance. And um, let's say on the bass here that I had a curve that uh, came here, 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 and there, and space bar to finish. And let's go in and trim away this guy right there. Okay. So let's say within my bass, you know, I've got these open vectors. Well, one line cannot dead end to another. You know, there's just no, you can't. Um, you know, it, there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. So I'm going to have to, you know, uh, do some kind of editing or something, uh, whether it be, you know, going in and, and uh, trying to. Let me make sure my layers, layer is still locked. It won't let me do anything with that. Let's unlock it. Um, uh, let's say I, you know, I close this together here. And uh, so now this vector is going around and uh, let's um, you know, trim that there. And you know, I've got this vector here that I've just created with that line. You know, it's now if I uh, look at it as uh, you know uh, it's it's closed but I had to trim away some of the detail you know to clean it up and everything and stuff so you just got to go through and you've got to you know eliminate what needs to be eliminated or connect or close what needs to be connected or closed you know uh, but uh, you got to put in the work on that one Type of thing and it's node editing it's 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 uh, trimming and, and and making sure that lines are connected and things and for the most part if I had open vectors in here I could you know right click on my screen and selection select all open vectors and if I had open vectors and it selected them that's gonna help point me in the direction it's gonna select all those open vectors it's gonna point me in the direction of where I need to start looking to work on and things and then up from there I've just got to put in the time Got to put in the time and clean it up. So, from there. All righty. Well, it's 9:28. Uh, you know, if you, you know, if if you, um, you know, we just went over a few little basics and stuff, kind of get a little bit of an understanding. Um, I would like to do a kind of a part two to this because I would like to get into talking about these tools that are available to us here within our Vetric software. 
um, such as our template tools and uh, you know saving a template uh, you know a toolpath template and and the array copy templates and merging templates and things or toolpath should I say I'd like to get into those uh, a little bit more and stuff um, and all but uh, if you have any questions on anything now's the time to ask we'll, we'll spend the next couple minutes on questions and everything but this was just a small small amount of uh, you know basics and things to kind of get, get a feel for and all um, but one of the things I really want to stress really want to stress with your job setups for successful job setups and uh, uh, minimizing minimizing uh, hitting your, your Z limits and things on your home start position right out of the gate and all that stuff be sure be sure be sure be sure before you calculate your tool pass and stuff look at your job setup that that, that area is there for a reason and uh, make sure your Z gaps above the material or you know you're at a safe distance of travel uh, make sure your home start position is set adequately and again as your material gets thicker and things that number needs to go down because you're losing you know you don't have that much room to start and all it's very important um, in everything and uh, uh, in part two um, I want to talk about this model position in the material uh, section here and this has to do with 3d models and in part two we'll kind of we'll touch on on that section and stuff about positioning and model within our material and everything but uh, I wanted I want this to be very basics uh, you know uh, the kind of the key some of the key things safe Z heights home start positions uh, you know what is layers and how can we work with them effectively um, you know uh, importing images and uh, uh, working with those where how we can you know add custom templates and or, or, or backgrounds and stuff to our, our preview cuts and things and how we can actually add a custom background in the background to uh, help with customer good selling points and things like that you know uh, what options we have within our options and things and those are the kind of the basic things I wanted to kind of just get off the table for right now and uh, cover and then I'd like to do a second part of this at some point in time where we go into a few more basic things and then we'll start uh, getting you know more specific on you know how to use this toolpath that toolpath and stuff down the road but uh, I'm not gonna you know I know for you advanced guys and girls that have been out there for a while if it's too basic for you I can understand you know that's that's where you would skip these classes and videos and all and enjoy your Monday evenings and stuff but uh, I think these videos will help a lot of people just kind of get up feel for things so if you enjoyed this class smash that like button and you know give me a thumbs up um all right let's see here uh, i think in uh our next class we'll talk about uh we'll talk a little bit more about tracing images you know we talked about importing vectors and stuff and all and how we trace those images and save those images export them out as dxf files so we don't have to ever trace them again that's a key tip uh, why trace the same picture hundreds of times over every time you want to use it trace it once save that DXF so you can just import it in and move on you know and stuff um, let me know if you have any questions about anything and um, I'll be happy to help or if, if, if in the comment section if there's something uh, that you'd like to um, if there was a, if there's anything any topic that you'd like to cover throw it out in the comment section and stuff and uh, you know we'll do it um, the last thing that I'm going to close on, uh, with you guys and girls is, um, I want to, uh, I don't know how many of you have, uh, you know, uh, get a chance to play around with it and all that stuff. Uh, but with our, uh, tools and everything within our tools and stuff, how many, by, by a show of hands, how many of you have used the distort tool or use it often and stuff? It's one of my fun tools to play around with. Uh, I don't like, a lot of times there's just those times where cookie cutter text is, you know, no matter what decorative font I come up with and stuff and everything. And, and you know, I can curve and I can rotate and stuff. But there's just times I want to have some fun and I want to distort something. Now, uh, key fact for all you beginners that are just, uh, you know, working with the distort tool. When you distort an object doesn't have to be text if it's an object uh, text a uh, vector object you know a shape or something when you use the distort tool it is no longer a vector object it is no longer a text object 
It is now an object inside of an envelope. So imagine taking something and throwing it inside of an envelope and however I distort or, or bend or flex that envelope, that object is gonna take on that shape and everything and all so use your distort tool to have some fun but understand that make sure you got your spelling right if it is text make sure you got the right font because there's no going back besides the undo button but i like having fun with the uh the uh, distort tool uh for different things and uh you know you can use a simple bounding box you can use a single curve if i drew a curve on here or maybe two curves and i want to distort it between two curves i like using the just the the basic bounding box and everything and when i do uh, it puts this box, it's like throwing these letters that I've got selected here. It's like throwing them inside of an envelope. You see this dotted line around them now. And now this envelope, no matter how I twist and turn this envelope, uh, you know, on this dotted line, I can add and make this line a, uh, an arc instead of a, you know, or, or, you know, a busy a curve. And I can, you know, start to distort and have some fun, um, you know, and uh, I can, you know, really start to kind of manipulate things and let's, pull this corner up here a little bit higher uh, type of deal and I can start to have some uh, fun in, in creating shapes and uh, you know I usually a lot of times I'll do this uh, but um, you know when we come back in here uh, let's say that uh, I want this to be back to a straight line uh, let's take this one back to a straight line and let's bring this in down a bit and let's bring this in up here and bring it down here you ever see those uh, pendant flags uh, where you, you know, it's like go team type of deal. You know, uh, you can have some fun with that. Uh, but um, uh, the distort tool is a, is a fun tool. We're editing the envelope when we want to distort. It's edited the envelope and everything. And uh, we can have some fun with that. Uh, again, we can change things, you know, to an arc and we can really kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, all kinds of different shapes and designs and stuff. Uh, you know, we can add, we can create curves. I can insert a point. Let's say I want to do insert a point here. So I could take this point. Maybe I want to drag this point up a little bit. And uh, maybe I want this to be a line and, and this to be a curved area here, you know, to distort. Whatever the case may be. But uh, have some fun with it to get you out of the cookie cutter. Um get you out of the uh, cookie cutter type of text and you can download thousands of fonts and have creative fonts and all but you can really start to kind of have some fun and mix and match and, and, and do all kinds of neat things with your text and your signs and stuff and really kind of uh, have some fun and uh, and all that stuff uh, so uh, heck you know if you wanted to you could also um, you know distort objects and everything and um, let's uh, let's see what happens if we distort our uh, our bass here you know, I could take and, uh, you know, get him a little bit fatter and let's kind of bring him and change him up. And let's uh, let's put a little bit of a curve here and see if I want to change him a little bit, kind of pinch him in, uh, make him look like a koi fish uh, more so than a, a trout with that little koi mouth or what have you. You know, I can do all kinds of uh, funky things, you know, and stuff and kind of distort it. But uh, yeah, and uh, now he looks more like a garfish or something than a, than a bass. But uh, you can have fun, do play with the distort tool. If you don't ever get to use it, it's one of those tools that kind of sits there and it's there. Uh, but we, we don't we don't really use it that much. And uh, just know that now, I mean, this is not text. You know, notice when I click on it, it that that envelope that's that's around it comes around it, and everything. Um, and uh, if I go into node editing to edit. It's editing the nodes of that envelope, not the letters. So there's no, it's no longer has nodes and none of that stuff. It's it's like sticking something within an envelope and all. But uh, you can have some really good fun with it and uh, create all kinds of neat, cool little layouts of your text and stuff and so uh, and uh, and all that. Uh, great question. Somebody says, can you distort a 3D object? Uh, Todd, uh, Todd's uh, Todd's gonna challenge us. So let's go over our clip art real quick. And uh, I don't think so, Todd, but hey, what the heck, let's give her a try. Uh, let's throw a horse here. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. And uh, that object uh, with it selected, let's go into the distort tool and it's an invalid selection, okay? So distorting components is not an option, okay? It's not supported. All right, so great question, but no, it's just the 2D vectors and stuff, you know. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end here. Uh, we've been going at it for quite a few hours now. We're going to end here for the basics and and stuff. And um, we'll, we'll pick this up at a, in a part two 
uh, and, um, and and go over. But uh, hopefully for all you guys and girls that have been doing this for a while and you know all this, like the back of your hand and stuff, hopefully you kind of picked up something, just a little tidbit of information that might be helpful to you uh, the next time you, you do something. And uh, then uh, I'll, I'll come up with some more uh, in-depth things that we can kind of focus on on and stuff. Uh, yeah, Todd. Um, no, that if you want to distort or, or change something, that's a, that's a spire, that's a spire. And and if if we can end on an aspire note, uh, since Todd brought up uh, distorting a model and stuff, um, I'm gonna open up aspire. And you know, I'm always working in Vcard Pro because I try to make this to where everybody can do this. But let's one really quick thing. I just want to show you about distorting a model, uh, Todd. Uh, it would be an aspire function and let me just create a very quick and simple uh, uh, project here and let's go 12 inches by 12 inches so it's not too big and uh, we'll go three quarters here and I'm not focusing on the job setup I just want to kind of get this uh, done and out of the way uh, let's say I go into my clip art here and and I go into my clip art and let me go to my animals here and uh, let me grab let me see where he or she might be hiding. I'm going to let, let the animals load. Let them load. Let them load. All right. Now that they're fully loaded, let me come back up here and grab what I wanted to grab. Doom, doom, doom. All right. So, um this 3d horse here let's go into uh, dual view real quick so you can see the 3d horse here and stuff I'm gonna mirror him so he's flipping he is uh, he or she whatever is flipping the other way so let me just take and uh, mirror him real quick I'm just gonna flip him horizontally all right so let's say that I'm doing a, a, a design for a um, someone that does dressage and everything and uh, their horse and all and I want this horse to kind of be bowing its head a little bit more than it is and this is the only model I've got well one of the cool things that I have is the ability within Aspire is to slice a model um, uh, slicing a model um, allows me to follow a contour or a vector and so if I if I came in uh, and let me draw a vector first let me draw a curve here and I'm gonna start right here at the bottom of the neck and I'm gonna draw a curve just kind of right around this area here and everything space bar to finish all right so I've got this curve now I'm gonna take and I'm gonna go back into my modeling tools and I'm gonna go into the the slice model tool but now in order to slice a model uh, I have to have a vector selected and then I have to also have the component selected the model selected and I can go ahead and slice this and what it does is it creates a part A and a part B um, when it generates a model we might get some buffering so hang tight while it creates a second model, okay? So it creates a part A and a part B to this horse. Uh, and now on this horse, if I come in and select this and all, I can go ahead and get my pivot point in here and let me just, oh my God, I just did a mafia thing on the horse. Hold on a second. Uh, let's put that back. <laughs> um, let me grab this uh, pivot point here. Let me put it up there and everything. And now what that pivot point allows me to uh, come in and, uh, I'm going to tilt this horse's head down a little bit more and stuff. Now, when I did that, uh, notice how the combine mode created this, uh, you know, this combined section, how it puffed it up. And let me turn this to the side. You see that? So what I have to do is on those two parts there, I've got to change the combine mode to merge. Um, I want to merge those two parts together and things, okay? And uh, then from there, with those parts merged and stuff, now I can come in and I'm gonna take those two objects, uh, make them one again, I'm gonna bake them back together uh, as one object. And with that baked together, I can now, with that selected, I can go into my sculpting tool. And my sculpting tool is another thing within, I can use my sculpting tool and let me turn the diameter down a bit. Uh, but I can now come in here and uh, kind of uh, smooth out this um, this line here a bit and stuff and uh, clean that up some and everything. So uh, by um, 
doing that, you know, I've uh, essentially now able to have that horse's head bowing a little bit more and everything. So uh, that's that's how we would distort uh, a model, or in this case, split, right? We can take any model, we can split it and cut it along a vector line and stuff, and we can, we can adjust and move and rotate and all that stuff. We can have some fun with it. But again, that's an Aspire function, you know, and that's what the Aspire tools, you know, that gives the ability to, but I wanted to show that it's kind of a fun thing. A lot of people have never don't don't even know about what what splitting a model is, uh, and thing. It's basically splitting a model based on the vector that you've decided, and then kind of doing whatever you want to do with those two halves. Right. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're ending on that note. I want to thank you very much, and um, uh, hopefully, uh, you picked up a little bit something, and uh, um, we'll. Uh, if I didn't get to, if I missed a question at all, uh, and um, yeah, David, we might do part two next Monday, uh, next week and stuff, and then we'll kind of, you know, I'd like to just get some basics under the way, just to kind of get people back to the roots, you know, and stuff, and especially with the new folks and everything, and all that. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, make a good, uh, I don't, you know, I don't do a whole lot of Aspire-focused videos, because I know it's kind of, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have Aspire, a lot of people do. But I would love to start doing some Aspire classes, whether they're not live, maybe they're just uh, direct and to the point videos that people can watch and all. But I would love to start doing some uh, Aspire classes with modeling and creating models and things. But uh, all right, guys and girls, we're ending now. I said that like three or four times, but we are going to say good night here. And uh, until next time, have a great day. I want to thank you for joining us tonight on Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. If you're watching Spindle TV on YouTube, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. You can find out more information about our training and products by visiting us at www.digitalwoodcarver.com.